When I was in medical school and scouring the internet for advice on how to navigate this crazy journey, I would find advice that was either too superficial, too specific, or even worse, just telling me to just suck it up and push through because that's what they did. And since I couldn't find the advice and tips I was looking for during my second year of med school, I began to compile all the strategies that worked or didn't work for me for the internet to enjoy. And now after finishing medical school, residency, and being a full-time attending, here's what I would tell all med students. Let's get into it. Hey friends, welcome back to the channel. In case you're new here, my name is Lux. I'm a board certified internal medicine physician. I'm currently a second year cardiology fellow. And here at the MD Journey, we make content to help people like you succeed on your medical journey, but doing it with less stress. Now I know personally for me, one of the most stressful parts about medical school was to look for advice on things like studying, on resources, on just the next phase of the medical journey, and just not have a good place where somebody would just say, here is the honest truth on how you should approach this. And now that I've crossed that proverbial finish line of finishing medical school, finishing residency, and even being an attending for a year before I decided to go back to cardiology fellowship, I wanna just go ahead and share the things that I wish somebody on my first day of med school just says, look, sit down, this is what you need to hear, remember this for the next 10 plus years of your training, and you'll be good. Now number one is pattern recognition is what makes you great. I by no means am the smartest person in the room, but medical school definitely made me feel like I was the stupidest because there would be people that would memorize the most smallest pieces of details from enzymes, from reactions, from just how medications worked. And I was like, how am I gonna be a good doctor if I can't remember details like that person can? But what I realized is that as a physician, what people really are expecting from us is not this ability to memorize a small detail on a first aid book for a step one exam. Instead, they're hoping that you have the ability of taking this complicated puzzle, which is the patient presented to you, their history, their current complaints, anything that's new, their labs, their imagings, and being able to one, confirm what you think the leading diagnoses are, and two, what management decisions you'll have to make for this specific patient, everything else considered. And that's really where pattern recognition separates below average, average docs to amazing, spectacular physicians. And going back to medical school, every single month you would be doing a new topic that you'd ultimately have like a final exam or a quiz for. And during those three to four weeks, it would feel like it'd be a hard kind of push to finally get enough knowledge to finally get to that quiz and test and ideally get the highest score possible. But then as soon as you feel like you had mastery or close enough to that topic, you would automatically move to a new topic that you had no idea about. It makes you feel a little incompetent when day one is always kind of existing every four to six weeks. But when you're a physician, when I'm in my cardiology fellowship, yes, I'm always learning new things every single day, but I'm not all necessarily having to learn a new language every month. And so I can rely on a lot of the patients and repetitions that I've had during residency when I was a hospitalist and now as a cardiology fellow being two years into this, of knowing that I've seen thousands and thousands of patients. And so if somebody comes in with chest pain, I kind of have a framework of how I want to think about that patient. Now there's going to be small clues and nuances about that patient, maybe their labs, maybe their EKGs, maybe the history they give me that may make my scratch my head saying, I don't know if you're having a heart attack or I'm actually suspicious you're having a heart attack even though everything else doesn't fit. And that is really again what makes a great physician from a below average one. And so the more repetitions you do, which naturally in your medical training happens during your rotations, during your residency, during fellowship, is really where you become a great physician in this field that you ultimately pick. But the whole journey makes you feel like you have to be this amazing clinician early in medical school and honestly that's not your truth you become a great doctor through practice through a lot of repetitions through asking yourself how is this patient different than yesterday's patient that had a similar diagnosis but maybe i'm gonna have to treat this one a little bit differently knowing those little nuances picking up on the pattern recognitions, changing your frameworks over time is really what makes you a great doctor. Advice number two is access to knowledge is often good enough. As a cardiologist, there are going to be things that I need to know urgently. For example, if somebody loses their heart rate and they're requiring CPR, ideally I'm not having to pull up something on my phone to know how to do basic ACLS and save somebody's life. Those are things and kind of doses of medications and steps that I need to kind of have built in. And just like before, those come through repetitions. It's pattern recognition of how to manage ACLS, just doing it over over and over again, unfortunately, on patients who have a decompensated episode. But on the flip side, there are diagnoses that I'm aware of. My brain doesn't necessarily memorize what medication is first in line for them. I just know that if I see this, I need to think about these things and then go to the resource of my choice, whether it be up to date or as cardiology, we may use something different to specifically say for this diagnosis, what is the best option? As a quick example, currently as a cardiology fellow, I'm working in the ICU and often we get transfers from all over the Texas area of patients who are very sick. We had a lady who came 
treatment with myocarditis, which is a diagnosis you're well aware of in cardiology, but not everybody has myocarditis. It's not a common form of all the various things that I see in the ICU. Now for this patient, again, nothing in the top of my mind was telling me that these are the medications at these doses that I have to do. I took care of the patient the best I could, but I definitely had to look up things to make sure that I wasn't missing anything given that they had a diagnosis of myocarditis. And that's just an example of point number one, which is I know the disease and over time I'm going to see more of it and thus I will have better pattern recognitions and mental models of saying A, B, and C is what you should do for a patient critically ill with myocarditis, but I don't feel incompetent just because I don't know how to take care of it because I know there's been a lack of repetition up to this point. And so while medical school may make you feel like you have to memorize every piece of detail, and yes, you do for the quiz and test just to make sure you're going to the next phase, and you are going to always have classmates that are going to make it verbally very clear that they memorized a piece of detail that maybe you forgot, and that was going to make you feel less inadequate comparatively to them, but it is not ultimately will make you a better or worse doctor than them. It's ultimately going to be this focus that the patient in front of you, that puzzle that we're talking about, that step one of pattern recognition is what you really need to build. That's the muscle you really need to care about the details will come where they matter. Tip number three is that patient rapport is a skill you need to highly prioritize. There are great doctors who have terrible bedside manner, and there are average doctors who have amazing bedside manner. And honestly, if you ask the majority of the patients, most people will prefer that second interaction because there's more trust, there's more communication, and often there's more of a permission of doctor, you may not know the answers, but you have my permission to have some time to look into the next steps. Again, because I prioritize patient reports so much naturally because I like this job because I get to work with people one-on-one -on -one and having jokes with them, knowing more about them, knowing about their families, where they come from, or just calming situation down. In a prior episode, we talked about how you have hard conversations with patients when they're not doing well, when you're worried that they may pass sooner than they hope and have to have that conversation with them and family. I talk about my approach there, but even being good at those difficult conversations allows a patient to just be able to trust you as their physician. Even though I'm a currently a fellow, a patient may look at me as the attending just because they have more interactions with me and more of those difficult conversations. And so even though I may not be able to have immediate decisions on what to do management wise, because I'm certainly still in training, I definitely feel this permission from the patient saying, you know, what about this? And I may say, I'm not exactly sure about A, B, and C, but I'll get back to you and I'll tell you how we're going to approach that problem. And because I have that nice rapport building with that patient over the span of hours and days, they often will give me the permission of saying, sounds good. Just please go ahead and circle back and we'll talk about that. Versus if I came into bed side and very egotistic and I had brilliant intellect to memorize small pieces of details to be able to take care of a patient well, but I couldn't actually build a bond with them. Remember, patients are often scared. They're often anxious. Some are just very stressed and frustrated about the whole medical system and they have a complete right to be. If you mismatch your attitude with that patient, it doesn't matter how smart you are. They will not often give you enough permission to take care of them adequately. So understand that your patient rapport, your ability to really communicate with patients and go into a room is going to be super important. Whenever Ever taught the marketing of being a great doctor, but often it just comes with being a decent human being, using your ears to listen to them and not just asking about the next symptoms on your checklist that med school often teaches you to do. And one of the questions you should start asking yourself early in training is if you're going into a patient's room, can I interact with them the way that I would if I was their only main provider? And that really changes things. Often as a cardiology fellow and as a resident, I would have patients in my continuity clinic. That means that these are patients assigned specifically to me. They don't see my attendings. They don't see anyone else. They see me attending supervises my decision making for them. But in their eyes, I'm their main provider. And so can I build great relationships with them so that way they trust me as a provider and not just a trainee that they unfortunately was assigned to. So just remember medical school will make you feel like you need to treat the disease, but you have to treat the patient first that has a diagnosis. And if you do a better job of building that relationship, the entire job becomes one more enjoyable and a lot more effective. Number four is that the best thing you can do for yourself in medical school is changing and transitioning from the reporter to the manager. I see this a lot, especially when I was attending and now as a fellow where I work with a lot of residents and med students where I have, you know, them see the same patients I'm seeing, but I obviously give them first shot on what would you like to do, Sam or Sarah, about this patient who has chest pain, who has this arrhythmia when I was in medicine attending and I would have, you know, nurse practitioners work with me or med students work with me. I would say this patient looks like they may have a stroke. What kind of things would you like to do to work that up? Now, most average and below average med students go into telling me the story about that patient, which seems relevant and it is relevant to most senses but often the story only includes certain pertinence that ultimately get to the more significant part which is what would you like to do for this person if you're telling me this great story that it could be included in their biography but you have no idea how to manage their care then you haven't become a better clinician 
during your training. On the flip side, if you start asking yourself as you're about to go see the patient for the first time or as you're about to go into a clinic room and saying, what are the main complaints that I'm getting called to see this patient for? What's the main patient's reason for visit? And this clinic visit, the emergency room called me for this patient having chest pain. I've already looked at their vitals before I went there. What type of things am I thinking that I should make sure I ask? And thus, when I present them to my attending, being me or somebody else, they might say, it's so-and-so is a 47-year-old coming with chest pain. But as you go into that patient interaction, you want to start asking yourself what main things you're thinking about, what questions you want to ask, what tests you want to order, what treatments you may already want to begin to just see if it actually helps the patient and get into that manager aspect. And one of the most key things to remember here is that often early on, especially when you're rotations, you are going to be wrong and you are going to be incomplete in your thought process of taking care of that disease pattern. And that is exactly how it's supposed to be. When you're first starting out, you are likely going to miss some critical diagnoses on a patient or miss something very straightforward. For example, somebody can come in with chest pain and you can tell me, I think it's because they had a basketball injury. And I show you their labs and their EKGs and you realize that you missed a heart attack. And the flip side, you may be convinced a patient has a heart attack, but I tell you from my experience in their physical exam, it's 100% musculoskeletal. That will come with time. But the main benefit of being that decision maker and making more attempts is that you get better at identifying those patterns and creating those mental models. You don't get so much benefit of creating a history and doing your subjective and objective over time. Every patient is different, there's not a lot of repetition there. But making management decision is really, again, what separates you from your peers and how quickly you do so. Being hyper-focused on being a manager now allows you to become better at making simple decisions and then over time you become a little bit more adept at making those little nuances and then it keeps kind of building up. Compared to your peers who are still focused on grading a great HPI that they are delayed and when they ultimately make a decision plan, then you know you may be hundreds of patients in front of them because you started that process a lot sooner. And so key takeaway. If you're on your rotation, if you're seeing any patient, start to ask yourself, if I was the only person taking care of this patient, what would I do? And doing so, again, you are going to make answers and solutions that are correct. A lot of them that will probably be wrong early on. And then over time, you will learn about that much more than you will on how you're presenting the patient. And then finally, tip number five, focus on being an efficiency king and queen. Now, efficiency matters at all phases of the medical journey. You may be a slower learner compared to your peers. That doesn't matter. Comparatively, if you are, for example, doing a system on how you study that could be a lot more efficient for you if you just did a few changes here and there, that allows you for more repetition. It doesn't matter if Jim and Sally are doing three passes of their material and you can only do two on your best day. If what you're doing right now only allows you to do one pass, you are shortchanging yourself for the best results you possibly can get. And so always ask yourself, are all my systems on how I manage my time, my week, my studying, my retention, my CV development and resume building, my shadowing, everything has a process, your personal life. Do those systems exist? If they don't, why not? And what should you kind of create as a basic foundation? And if they exist, which they likely do for things like studying and time management, management, then where are the biggest pain points that you want to try to work on improving? If you need more help with things like time management and studying a little bit more efficiently, I'm going to include some free resources down below in case you're interested, including our Med School Success Handbook, which has tons of free tips on just on how to do that. But ask yourself, like, do you have systems on how you do things when you're a med student? When you're on your rotations, do you have a system on how you pre-chart, how you see patients as quickly and efficiently but effectively as possible? Do you have a system on how you write notes, how you present patients, how you kind of study the rest of the day? When you're a resident and fellow like myself, do you have a system on how you're self-learning and studying despite being busy with clinical duties? When you're an attending, do you have a system on how you continue to acquire information despite being busy with all your other clinical duties and your personal life? And P.S. If you guys are interested on how I would study in every single phase of the medical journey, including being an attending, I'm making an episode on that pretty soon. So make sure you subscribe and hit that notification bell to know when that episode goes live. And so again, main takeaway, efficiency definitely does matter. By no means do you have to be as efficient as your classmates. Everybody is on their own level. But you have to ask yourself, am I doing everything at the best of my ability? And the answer is there's always some room for improvements. What small changes do I want to make now and reassess in a few days, in a week, in a month to see if that led to a fruitful kind of outcome? And if so, how can I double down on that? And ask yourself how you can do that on all of the different aspects in your life. I promise you, you're going to be much happier on the medical journey. But those friends are my tips as an attending, as a fellow currently on things I just wish somebody just sat down and said, Lux, this is what you need to hear on your first day of med school. Please listen up. And again, if you want all those free resources, including how I study the medical school, including all the tips on how I manage my time, study for boards, the med school handbook, plus all the resources I've created over the past eight years, if you just click the link down below, I'll go ahead and send it to your email ASAP. And if you want a full in-depth handholding of how to manage every kind of struggle on the medical journey, I've been there. So we created solutions for you guys in the med school blueprint that's linked down below in case you guys are interested. But most importantly, I just really want to know what you guys think about this episode, what you think about those tips. Let me know in the
in the comment section down below. And if you found these tips and strategies to be helpful, all I really ask is you hit that like button because one, it helps the channel grow. Two, it helps me understand what type of topics you want me to make in future videos. And three, there's probably somebody out there that may benefit from this episode. And if you hit like, maybe YouTube will go ahead and share it with the interweb. And if you haven't done so already, consider hitting that subscribe notification bell. No worries if you haven't. And if you enjoy this episode, check out this episode right here on how to be happy in medicine and this episode right here on all the study strategies that I use ultimately to get a 3.9 GPA in med school. Enjoy these. And as always, thank you so much for being a part of my journey. Hopefully I was a little help to you guys on yours. I'll see you guys in the next one. Peace.